All rise, we will obey. The International Criminal Court is now in session. L'audience de la Cour Penal Internationale est ouverte. Please be seated, we will be Now that we're finished with the photographers, may I say good morning, everyone. Um, court officer, could you please call the case? Thank you, Your Honor. The situation in Libya, in the case of the prosecutor against Saif al-Islam Gaddafi and Abdullah al-Senesi, ICC 0111-0111. Thank you. May I ask the parties to introduce themselves for the record, starting with the Office of the Prosecutor, please. Good morning, Your Honour. Helen Brady appearing on behalf of the prosecution and with me today, Mr. Julian Nichols and Mr. Hesham Morad. Thank you. Thank you very much. The defence of Mr. Al Sanusi, please. Uh, good morning, Your Honour. Uh, Rodney Dixon on behalf of Mr. Abdullah El Sanusi, uh, assisted today by Ida Daxdal. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Government of Libya. Uh, good morning, Madam President. Uh, I'm Paim Akhavan, appearing on behalf of the Government of Libya, together with my colleagues, Ms. Emma Collins and Mr. Paul Clark. Thank you very much. Office of Public Counsel for Victims. Good morning, Your Honor. Victims in these proceedings are represented by the Office of Public Counsel for Victims. Appearing today, Mr. Mohamed Abdu, Associate Legal Officer, and I am Paulina Masida, Principal Counsel. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, today, the Appeals Chamber is delivering its judgment on the appeal by the defense of Mr. Al Sanusi against the decision of pre-trial chamber one entitled decision on the admissibility of the case against Abdullah Al Sanusi. The decision was rendered on 11th October 2013. In today's summary, I refer to this decision as the impugned decision. I shall now summarize the appeals chamber's judgment Please note that only the judgment itself is authoritative. It will be notified to the parties shortly after this hearing. I'll start with the procedural background. On 2nd April 2013, Libya filed before the pretrial chamber one, pursuant to Article 19 of the statute, a challenge to the admissibility of the case against Abdullah Al Sanusi. The prosecutor, defense, and victims all participated and filed submissions in the proceedings. On 11th October 2013, the pretrial chamber issued the impugned decision holding that Libya was investigating the same case as a prosecutor and that Libya was neither unwilling nor unable to do so genuinely. As such, the case was found to be inadmissible before this court. The defense filed its appeal on 17th October 2013. 
and then on the 4th of November 2013, filed this document in support of the appeal on behalf of Abdullah Al Sanusi against pre trial chamber one's decision on the admissibility of the case against Abdullah Al Sanusi, which I shall refer to as a document in support of the appeal. Libya, the prosecutor, and victims all similarly participated and filed submissions in the proceedings. The defense grouped its arguments under three grounds of appeal. However, the second ground of appeal essentially was an application to submit additional evidence on appeal in respect of the first ground of appeal. As this is a preliminary issue, the appeal chamber will address the admission of admi additional evidence first. The defense annexed to its document in support of appeal three items that it requested to be admitted into evidence on appeal. In later filings, there were numerous pieces of additional evidence relied upon by both the defense and Libya. The appeals chamber recalls and reaffirms its jurisprudence from the recent Gaddafi admissibility judgment regarding ad additional evidence in relation to appeals of an admissibility decision. The appeals chamber's rule is corrective in nature and as such, facts which postdate the impugned decision are beyond the scope of the proceedings on appeal. In relation to evidence which predates the impugned decision, the appeals chamber finds that in the circumstances of this case, it would not be appropriate to consider this material because the pretrial chamber did not do so. Accordingly, the appeals chamber decided not to admit any of the additional evidence on appeal. Ground three of the appeals, whether the pretrial chamber erred in finding that Libya is investigating and prosecuting the same case as that before this court. I shall now turn to the third ground of appeal, which relates to the pretrial chamber's finding that Libya is investigating the same case as the prosecutor. The defense essentially alleges that the pretrial chamber made three errors in this regard, which I shall briefly address in turn. The, defense, the defense's first submission in ground three is that the pretrial chamber relied almost exclusively on redacted material. The defense argues that this was unfair and prejudiced the defense's ability to respond to the admissibility challenge. The appeals chamber is not persuaded by the defense argument. The pre-trial chamber expressly noted the potential unfairness to the defense. In doing so, the chamber observed that only the names and other identifying information of witnesses had been redacted and specifically stated that in making its decision, it relied only on the redacted versions that were disclosed to the defense. Furthermore, despite not being able to investigate the sources of the information, there was no unfairness to the defense because they are, these are admissibility, admissibility proceedings concerned with the venue for trial as opposed to criminal proceedings concerned with the criminal responsibility of an accused person. In these circumstances, the appeals chamber finds that there was no error in the pretrial chamber's exercise of discretion regarding the necessity and proportionality of the re reductions and subsequent reliance on the material. The defense's second argument, second submission in ground three, is that the pretrial chamber erred in finding the same case was being investigated because the case before the court, and I quote, clearly involves conduct and incidents that are spread across the whole country. And thus, the Libyan domestic proceedings cannot be said to cover the same case if Libya's evidence is limited to certain locations, mainly in Benghazi, unquote. In that regard, the defense argues that the pretrial chamber erred by not reaching the same conclusion as in the case of Mr. Gaddafi and that the pretrial chamber's interpretation of the term same case was incorrect. Again, the appeals chamber is not persuaded by these arguments. First, the appeals chamber finds no error in the pretrial chamber's distinction between the present case and that of Mr. Gaddafi's. This is for two reasons. First, unlike Mr. Gaddafi's case, 
Mr. Alsanosis' case was limited to criminal acts that allegedly occurred in Benghazi. Secondly, in the pre present case, Libya submitted substantially more evidence than in the case of Mr. Gaddafi. Thus, it was not unreasonable for the pretrial chamber to reach a different conclusion in relation to Mr. Al Sanusi than in the case of Mr. Gaddafi. The second error alleged by the defense is that the pretrial chamber applied the wrong test in finding that the same case was being investigated. The appeals chamber recently considered the issue of the correct legal test to apply with regards to the same case in the Gaddafi admissibility judgment. The appeals chamber reaffirms its finding that, and I quote, what is required is a judicial assessment of whether the case that the state is investigating sufficiently mirrors the one that the prosecutor is investigating. The appeals chamber considers that to carry out this assessment, it is necessary to use as a comparator the underlying incidents under investigation both by the prosecutor and the state alongside the conduct of the suspect, uh, suspect under investigation that gives rise to his or her criminal responsibility for the conduct described in those incidents, unquote. In the present case, the pretrial chamber found that as a matter of law, the specific incidents alleged against Mr. Al Sanusi did not form part of the comparators in deciding whether Libya is investigating the same case. This is not in line with the jurisprudence of the appeals chamber that I just summarized. Nevertheless, when assessing the specific facts of the case, the pretrial chamber did assess the specific incidents under investigation and used them to conclude that Libya was investigating the same case. In addition, based upon the factual findings contained in the impugned decision, on its face, it does not appear that the domestic investigation does not sufficiently mirror the case before the court. While the defense challenges some of the factual findings of the pretrial chamber in that regard, these challenges are either not sufficiently substantiated or based on an incorrect understanding of the scope of the case against Mr. Al Sanusi. Accordingly, the appeals chamber rejects the defense arguments in relation to the issues of the same case. The defense's third, final, th third and final submission in ground three is that none of the crimes against Mr. Al Sanusi, none of the crimes Mr. Al Sanusi is charged with domestically cover the crime of persecution under the Rome Statute, which is covered by the case before the court. Again, the appeals chamber is not persuaded by the defense arguments. The appeals chamber finds that there is no need for Libya to charge Mr. Al Sanusi with the international crime of persecution per se. This is because the correct question to answer is whether the same conduct as opposed to the same crime is being investigated or prosecuted. On the facts of this case, Libya envisages that Mr. Al Sanusi will be charged with inter alia the following domestic offenses, civil war, attacks upon the political rights of a Libyan subject, stirring up hatred between the classes and other crimes associated with fomenting sedition and civil war. Further, the actual conduct which underpins Libya's case as a whole is the use of security forces to suppress demonstrators against a political regime. In relation to sentencing, the appeals chamber knows that the pretrial chamber came to its conclusions on the combined considerations of crimes charged at the national level and also considerations that a judge may have regard to on sentencing. Therefore, the conduct underlying the crime of persecution is sufficiently covered in the Libyan proceedings such that it can be said that substantially the same conduct as alleged before this court is being investigated by the Libyan authorities. As such, the appeals chamber can find no error in the pre-trial chamber's analysis. In sum, the appeals chamber rejects the defense's third ground of appeal. Having concluded, having concluded that defense has not established that the pre-trial chamber's determination that Libya is investigating the same case as that before the course was not erroneous, I shall now turn to the first ground of appeal, 
With this ground of appeal, the defense challenges the pretrial chamber's finding that Libya is neither unwilling nor unable genuinely to investigate and prosecute Mr. Al Sanusi. That is the second limb of the admiss admissibility test of Article 17 1A of the statute. The defense makes four broad submissions in relation to this ground of appeal. First, errors in relation to the lack of contact between the defense and Mr. Al Sanusi. Second, errors in relation to the lack of counsel in domestic proceedings. Third, errors in relation to other purported due process violations occurring in the domestic proceedings. And finally, errors in relation to the pretrial chamber's finding that Libya is not unable to try Mr. Al Sanusi. The defense submits that three specific errors arise because the pretrial chamber did not adequately consider the lack of contact between Mr. Al Sanusi and his defense team in the current admissibility proceedings. The first error alleged is that the pretrial chamber should not have decided the case should not have decided that the case is inadmissible in circumstances where the defense had not yet received instructions from Mr. Al Sanusi. In support of this argument, the defense submits inter alia that there existed, and I quote, undeniable right to counsel under the Rome Statute, unquote. For the reasons that I shall summarize now, the appeals chamber is not convinced by the arguments of the defense. The appeals chamber notes that the court's legal framework provides essentially for two forms of participation of a suspect in relation to admissibility proceedings. First, a suspect has the right to challenge the admissibility of a case pursuant to Article 192A of the statute. Second, pursuant to Rule 58.3 of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence, a suspect has the right to submit written observations on admissibility on an admissibility challenge filed by <laughs> someone else. However, this latter right only applies to suspects who have been surrendered to the court or have voluntarily appeared before it. Mr. Al Sanusi is not in either of these positions. The provisions relied upon by the defense with regard to a general undeniable right to counsel only confer a right to counsel in this court's criminal proceedings or during an investigation by this court's prosecutor, but not admissibility proceedings. <coughs> Accordingly, Mr. Al Sanusi did not have a right to participate in the proceedings in relation to Libya's admissibility challenge. It follows that he also did not have the right to be fully represented by counsel in the way argued for by the defense. Nevertheless, the appeals chamber recalls the broad discretion provided to the pretrial chamber under Rule 58.2. Under this provision, a chamber may decide to grant a suspect participatory rights that extend beyond those provided for in this course text. In the present case, the pretrial chamber allowed the defense to participate in the proceedings by filing submissions, but did not require that the, def the defense receive instructions from Mr. Al Sanusi. Accordingly, what remains to be determined is whether it was unfair and unreasonable in the circumstances of the present case not to grant Mr. Al Sanusi broader participatory rights. In the view of the appeals chamber, the defense has not, establ has not established that the pretrial chamber erred in the exercise of its discretion. In fact, Many of the defense arguments appear to be based on the premise that Mr. Al Sanusi was entitled to participate in the proceedings. This, however, was not the case. Furthermore, as highlighted by the pretrial chamber, the defense did not submit that a visit was a necessary precondition. Indeed, the defense states on appeal that they proceeded, and I quote, proceeded on the basis that no admissibility challenge could succeed when Libya had refused to allow the defense to visit or speak with Mr. Al Sanusi, unquote, and thus sought an immediate decision on admissibility so that Mr. Al Sanusi could be transferred to The Hague, unquote. In these circumstances, 
The appeals chamber finds that the pretrial chamber's exercise of discretion was not so unfair and unreasonable as to amount to, to an abuse of, disc of discretion conferred by Rule 58.2. Furthermore, in respect of the pretrial chamber's finding that several defense allegations were generic and without proof, the defense alleges that the pretrial chamber failed to take into account that they could have been further substantiated if the defense could have discussed the case with his clients in a privileged and conv confidential environment, and that the pretrial chamber reversed the burden of proof because it was not for the defense to prove that irregularities had occurred. In support of this line of argument, the defense rely on human rights jurisprudence, indicating that an allegation of a human rights violation can, in some circumstances, demonstrate that a human rights violation has occurred if a state does not respond. With regards to whether the pretrial chamber failed to take into account the lack of instructions, the appeals chamber finds that the pretrial chamber explicitly stated that they would take this into account and as such can find no error. With respect to the reversal of the burden of proof, the appeals chamber recalls that a state, in this case Libya, bears the burden of proof to show that a case is inadmissible. Nevertheless, the pretrial chamber required the defense to sufficiently substantiate factual allegations. In the view of the appeals chamber, this, not, this does not amount to an error. The human rights jurisprudence relied upon by the defense can be distinguished from the present case because in those proceedings, a state directly responds to an allegation of a complaint. By contrast, the case as hand, at hand is primarily concerned with the relationship between states and this court. The defense also submits that Libya's failure to facilitate a visit between Al Sanusi and his lawyers demonstrates that Libya is both unwilling and unable in terms of Article 17. The appeals chamber notes that the defense does not explain how lack of contact with counsel would per se lead to a finding of unwillingness or inability, nor is this self-evident. Therefore, the arguments of the defense must be dismissed. Accordingly, the appeals chamber sees no error in how the pretrial chamber dealt with the lack of contact between the defense and Mr. Al Sanusi. The defense also argues that the pretrial chamber erred because it failed to take sufficiently into account the lack of legal representation in Libya's domestic proceedings concerning Mr. Al Sanusi. The defense makes four separate submissions which purportedly illustrates unwillingness and or inability. First, the defense argues that Libya's domestic laws have been violated as well as international human rights law. Second, it submits that any irregularity during the investigation and accusation stages taints any future proceedings in, in Libya irremediably. <coughs> Third, it argues that the pretrial chamber reversed the burden of proof and contradicted its findings in Gaddafi. Finally, it submits that the reason for lack of legal representation is not relevant. The appeals chamber will first address the defense arguments to the extent that they relate to the question of unwillingness. The appeals chamber emphasizes that in the context of admissibility proceedings, it is not called upon to decide per se whether certain domestic or international requirements of due process are being violated. The real question is whether the proceedings were conducted in a manner which in the circumstances is inconsistent with an intent to bring an accused to justice. As will be explained later, for a violation of due process rights to constitute unwillingness, the violation must be so egregious that the proceedings can no longer be regarded as being capable of providing any genuine form of justice to the accused. The appeals chamber considers lack of access to counsel may be, may be relevant for a determination that a state is unwilling 
genuinely to investigate and prosecute a suspect. Nevertheless, in the present case, the alleged violations of Mr. Al Sanusi's rights do not meet the threshold for a finding of unwillingness. In this regard, the appeals chamber notes Libya's submissions that the trial could not commence without Mr. Al Sanusi having a lawyer. In addition, the appeals chamber notes that the pretrial chamber found that the reason why Mr. Al Sanusi did not yet have a lawyer was primarily the security situation in Libya. The defense has not established that this finding was unreasonable. Turning to the question of the impact of lack of defense counsel in domestic proceedings has in respect of inability, the appeals chamber notes that neither party disputes that the appointment of counsel at trial is a, a prerequisite for the trial to take place in Libya. The defense submissions appear to be twofold. First, that the proceedings have been compromised to such an extent that they could no longer go ahead. In support of this proposition, the defense submits that human rights law suggests that under certain circumstances, lack of re legal representation in the early stages of proceedings may render a trial unfair. And if no trial can take place, then Libya is unable to try Mr. Al Sanusi. The appeals chamber considers that this proposition cannot be true. It is axiomatic that judicial proceedings may result in acquittal for any number of reasons. The second submission on the inability that the defense puts forward is that the pretrial chamber's findings are speculative and contradict its findings in, Gaddafi, in the Gaddafi admissibility decision. In this respect, the appeals chamber notes that the pretrial chamber found that Mr. Al Sanusi was in a detention center under the control of the government, unlike Mr. Gaddafi. Regarding the speculative nature of the finding, the pretrial chamber made its findings of inability on the basis of facts that presented itself to them at the time of the admissibility challenge, which inherently involves some form of speculation. The defense then submits that due process violations other than lack of a lawyer in the domestic proceedings also render Libya unwilling and unable genuinely to investigate and to prosecute Mr. Al Sanusi. The first issue that has to be addressed in relation to the defense submission is the definition of unwillingness in terms of Article 72C of the statute. The provision provides that Unwillingness is established if the proceedings were not or are not being conducted independently or impartially, and they were or are being conducted in a manner in the, which in the circumstances is inconsistent with an intent to bring the person concerned to trial, to justice. The defense submits that bringing an accused to justice must entail treating him humanely and fairly and conducting fair proceedings. These requirements are all integral to the definition of justice as a matter of international law. The appeals chamber observes that at first sight, Article 17.2c and the chapeau of Article 17.2 could potentially support the proposition argued by the defense. However, on a closer analysis of the text, context, object and purpose of Article 17.2c, such an approach is unsustainable. This is because the purpose of the exceptions under Article 17.2 to the principle that a case is inadmissible if it is being investigated or prosecuted domestically is to, present, to prevent the abuse of the principle of complementarity that results in the perpetuation of the impunity of perpetrators of the most heinous crimes. Further, this court was not established to be an international court of human rights, sitting in judgment over domestic legal systems to ensure compliance with international standards. As such, violations of a suspect's right in and of themselves are not sufficient to amount to unwillingness. However, notwithstanding this, 
there may be circumstances, depending on the facts of the individual case, whereby violations are so egregious that the proceedings can no longer be regarded as being capable of providing any form of genuine justice. Ultimately, whether a case will be inadmissible under Article 17.2c will depend on the precise facts of the case. In the light of the above, and for the reasons further elaborated in the written judgment of the Appeals Chamber, insofar as the defense argues that a state is unwilling genuinely to carry out the investigation or prosecution if it does not respect the fair trial rights of the suspect per se, this argument must be rejected. As the defense highlights, the pretrial chamber did not provide an extensive interpretation of Article 17.2c of the statutes and its requirements. However, this had no effect on the pretrial chamber's decision as a whole because the defense has not demonstrated the factual, that the factual findings of the pretrial chamber were unreasonable. The defense argues that the pretrial chamber overlooked substantial and compelling evidence that established that the conditions for holding a fair, impartial, and independent trial in Libya simply do not exist. However, the defense has failed to substantiate its argument and to indicate with sufficient precision the purported errors in the impugned decision. The defense has also put forward numerous other submissions alleging errors of fact in the remainder of this section. However, in the view of the appeals chamber, these submissions are either repetitive, can be explained by a misunderstanding of the definition of unwillingness, or by a misrepresentation of the impugned decision, or amount to mere disagreements with factual findings of the pretrial chamber. Accordingly, no error in the pretrial chamber's factual findings has been established. The defense also submits that the pretrial chamber's findings in relation to inability were unreasonable. The defense raises three sets of arguments in this regard. First, the defense submits that the pretrial chamber erred when it found that Libya exercised sufficient control over the detention center where Mr. al is held. This is because in the defense submission, militia groups participate in, the, in running the prison and have free access to both Mr. al and any defense witnesses. The appeals chamber observes that the pretrial chamber set out the publicly available evidence it relied upon in a footnote and also confidential ex parte evidence that the pretrial chamber relied upon. Having reviewed this evidence, it cannot be said that the pretrial chamber's findings were unreasonable. Secondly, the defense submits that the pretrial chamber's finding that the lack of security for judicial authorities and organs did not indicate that Libya is otherwise unable to carry out its proceedings was unreasonable. The defense submits that this finding is inconsistent with the decision in the Gaddafi case. The appeals chamber considers that, defense, that the defense has not established that the pretrial chamber's findings were unreasonable and that the distinction relied upon with respect of the Gaddafi case were accurate. In relation to the latter, the appeals chamber recalls that there are significant differences between the two cases. Thirdly and finally, the defense submits that the pretrial chamber erred in relation to the impact that the lack of security for witnesses had on Libya's ability to obtain the necessary evidence and testimony per Article 17.3. The appeals chamber recalls that the pretrial chamber noted that the investigative material included exculpatory evidence and specifically considered the defense submission that two witnesses were no longer prepared to testify. The appeals chamber does not find the pretrial chamber's finding unreasonable. For all these reasons, the defense third ground of first ground of appeal is dismissed. In sum, the appeals chamber therefore confirms the impugned decision and dismisses the appeal. The appeals chamber decision was taken unanimously. However, 
Judges Song and his Chaska have penned separate opinions to the appeals chamber's judgment. I shall now very briefly summarize these separate opinions. Judge Song, in his separate opinion, recalls his separate opinion in relation to the appeals chamber judgment on the admissibility decision in the Gaddafi case. In that separate opinion, he explained that in cases such as the present, there was no need to rely on incidents as comparators when determining whether the domestic investigation, investigation was the same as that before the court. He therefore disagrees with the parts of the judgment of the appeals chamber in relation to the third ground of appeal that emphasizes the importance of incidents for this determination. Nevertheless, Judge Song agrees that there was no error in the pretrial chamber's finding that Libya is investigating the same case. Similarly, Judge Uchaska, in her separate opinion, recalls her dissenting opinion in relation to the Gaddafi case. In that dissenting opinion, she explained why, in her view, the same person, same conduct test was flawed and that a different test should have been adopted. Nevertheless, based on her test, Judge Uchaska would also have concluded that there was no error in the pretrial chamber's finding that Libya was investigating the same case. Judge Chaska also addresses certain issues in relation to the first ground of appeal. Notably, the question of whether a distinction should be made between the domestic case against Mr. Al Sanusi and that against Mr. Gaddafi. This concludes my summary of the judgment. It only remains for me to thank the parties and participants, the interpreters and court reporters, and our audience in the gallery. I also generally would like to thank the registry staff for having facilitated this hearing in the first week of the court recess. Thank you. The session is now closed. All rise, Bavulave.